to Rocky Mountain Church. If you're visiting with us this morning, it's great having you here. Uh, the Dudex had about a week and a half where we went back to Wisconsin. We got to celebrate uh, the life of my grandma Blanche, who turned 101 after uh, in, in December, uh, but she passed away, and so we were there kind of celebrating her life, and what a legacy. Uh, we got to visit with uh, a lot of old friends and, and old neighbors, and the last group of people we visited with were some old neighbors of ours. They, when we left, they had two little boys. They're now young men, and we, we get to their house, and uh, we're playing in the backyard with all the kids, and one of their boys' names is, is Camden. He's always been a curious young man, and he comes up to me, and the first thing he says, we get there, I haven't seen him in about two years, he says, Mr. AJ, you have a lot of gray in your face. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of gray in your beard. And I replied, yes, Camden, that is correct. And as I was thinking about our summer series in the book of Ecclesiastes, as I heard that, self-reflection and the brevity of life and the reality that we are all snowflakes in a blizzard headed to the same direction, it was sobering. What do we do with the days we have left and how do we deal with the brokenness in our world The work that we have to do, the toiling away of relationships, the injustices that we see, the tensions in the culture and the political landscape. And so over the next 10 weeks or so, we are going to be marching through the book of Ecclesiastes. And my goal in this series is to help us deal with those tensions, the reality of living life in a broken world and, and at the same time, I always want to be looking for uh, clues, Christological, Christ-taught clues on how we handle the world that we live in. We're going to hear a first-hand account of one of the wisest men who ever lived displaying in true colors his march towards trying to find purpose, longing, happiness, joy, and the challenges that come with it. And we as Christians, if we are in Christ, are to live our lives in such a way in the midst of disappointment, brokenness, and pain, we are to live, live excuse me, with joy. So if, you've, if this is your first time looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, a few things to consider. It's lumped in with a couple other books that are, that are kind of around the thematic push of wisdom Literature, that's what they're called. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, these chunks of books in the middle of your Bible are focusing on how do we as human beings navigate life? How do we live life? And and Solomon, who uh, most of us would believe wrote this book, there are different theories about who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, but we're going to say Solomon wrote it. He's standing above his experiences, and he takes an honest inventory of those experiences and what they produced. It's really an exercise in evaluating the purpose in which and why you live. What am I here for? How can my life have impact despite death being on the horizon? What what am I leaving behind and what will people remember about me? If they'll remember it all. This will be a journey. And one that will provide us, I hope, with answers and hope. The writer, as you see, Solomon, from the line of David, did not come from perfection. David was a good man, but he had flaws. And we're going to see Solomon was a good man, but he had many flaws. And unlike Daniel, what we just studied, Solomon did not finish well. He didn't. The wisest man in all of Israel. He had everything, everything at his fingertips, and yet... He did not finish well. Solomon would die at 80 years old, and his son would take over, running things into the ground, leaving the kingdom of Israel divided. But he has something to give us. He has some good, rich realities for us to dive into. And so this morning, we are looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, your phones, let's turn there. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And this, this is the opening. In the first three verses, it says this. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. What a way to start the book in verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by the toil at which he toils under the sun? What could the writer be bent out of shape about? And if we assume it's King Solomon, therefore we need to understand how impactful, powerful, and affluent King Solomon actually was. Not only was he the wisest man, given wisdom by God, which we will see in 1 Kings, he was the son of David, he was commissioned to finish and build the first temple, and he took over at age 20 and ruled until he was about 60 years of age. It's a long time. Not only that, but if you equate his wealth to modern day dollars, King Solomon was worth about $2 trillion. Jeff Bezos has nothing on this guy, right? <laughs> even, even having all of that, one of the misconceptions we have about looking at King Solomon is we think that because he had all the wealth, all the wisdom, everything at his fingertips, he had it all together. He did not. But he asked for wisdom, right? He asked for wisdom in 1 Kings 3, 9. God says, I'll give you one thing, and this is what he says. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between what is good and what is evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? There's a sense of humility here. As he starts his kingship, the years of his authority, and we see in his life, wisdom actually being applied in in situations, in courtroom situations, he's displaying wisdom, he's gaining value and respect among his people. But then we get to Ecclesiastes and he says, if all is vanity, then what's the point? If, If all of that, even the wisdom I attained and was given, if all of that is vanity... How do I live my life with the right mindset? What what, what happens here in the opening chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes, it attaches us to the very important doctrine of the fall. Of the fall in Genesis 3. Do you you remember that narrative where Adam and Eve are, they are in the garden to live forever in community with God. And yet the Natash, the Satan, the serpent, they tempt. He tempts. He comes into the garden. He's able to come in and out of the garden. He tempts Adam and Eve and they take of the fruit in which they were not supposed to touch, let alone eat. And sin entered the, 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 the life, that the, the, we were born into it. And in Genesis 3.16, let me tell you this, this is what happened. After the fall, after the eating of the apple, God says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your des- desire shall be contrary to your husband. Relational tension, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your life and capitulated and have eaten of the tree of which I command you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. If, if we miss the opening chapters of the Bible, we miss the heart condition of what Solomon, who has experienced what we will see, everything under the sun, because of his affluency, because of his, his acumen, because of his kingship, he was given all authority, and therefore he had the authority to go and experience, to try. If we miss the fact that you and I are born into a broken world, Ecclesiastes won't make sense. It, it will be like, well, why do we have to listen to this downer guy? Right? 
But if we, if we take a hard look at the world we live in and the optics of the world we live in, we are going to start agreeing with Solomon. The vanities of vanities. He, he goes on to say in verse 4, talking about the world we live in, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There they flow again. There's a lot about life you and I will never understand. Are we okay with that? There's a lot about the world we live in. And in this case, Solomon, through the, through the visual aid of creation, is looking at it and saying, a lot of this doesn't make sense. I can't wrap my mind around. There's a, there's a couple things in that section of Scripture, 4 through 7, I want to pull out for you. One is this. Our lives are like snowflakes in a blizzard. But what is Solomon talking about? He's, he's talking about, what, even when I pass away, will someone remember me? But will someone remember what, what I was and what I stood for? You know, the, when we celebrate my grandma, you, you stand before and everyone reads all these great things, but how long will we be forgotten? That's a sobering thing to think about. If you're given 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years we're back to the dust in which we were created. Things move on despite us. I know that's hard for us to stomach, but, but I think Solomon, our writer, desires that we understand this concept right off the bat. There's a lot we don't understand about the world, and we are here. We are here with such a short time frame to live and to function and I don't believe that Solomon's trying to give us a depressing synopsis of life. I don't think that's his goal. But he's being vulnerable enough with us. He's opening up about the reality that lies in front of him after having it all and experiencing it all in the culture he lived in. He's setting a precedent. He's desiring us to think in reality so we can be prepared for what he hopes to teach us. Because as, as we find out, if, if we look to the world to provide and fulfill our longings, then true disappointment will be our future. You're going to see it play out here over the next weeks, time and time again. I, I think if if the psalmist and if Solomon could sit down and have a conversation, they would agree with Psalm 112.7 that says this. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. So much of our lives are spent trying to make this life better or setting it up in such a way to alleviate the pain and the difficulty. But according to Solomon, that is a vain task, which will lead to more disappointment and frustration. I hope that this series, as we mark, march through the book of Ecclesiastes, becomes a, a, a time saver for you. Think about this for a second. What if you and I Right? We're the type of people that spent more time thinking about how we can live with purpose on this earth rather than the earth, the world and its trappings being our purpose. Think about how many years, how many hours we spend thinking about how can I, via what the world has to offer, make it better for myself. Void of purpose, void of longing, void of a direction. What a blessing it is to have this book in front of us this summer. What a sobering fact it is to come face to face with how the world actually works. 
So, so he, he sets a precedence for us that, hey, we can't understand everything the world is putting on display, that it's impossible. And we are temporary, all of us. Temporary in this window of time. And there's just a lot we don't understand about life, the rhythms of nature, the repeating style of things. And you're going to see a tension in this man's heart. An elevated tension of what do I then do? What do I think? How do I make decisions? How do I get up in the morning? And what am I aiming for? What am I longing for? He goes on to say in verse 8, all things are full of weariness. They're full of weariness and a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing which it is said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. He's, he's gazing upon his own experiences, you guys. We, we get the privilege to sit under this teaching of a man who's objectively viewing the world and saying, there's nothing new. Nothing new under this sun. He looks upon a broken world and realizes just that it's broken. It's vital for us to understand that this broken world we live in was corrupted by sin. And because of that, it will never produce what we desire it to produce. It cannot. It doesn't have the authority to. We are called to live in this place, be faithful in this place, and continue to take dominion of it. But we must never worship it hoping that it will provide us with meaning and purpose. And this is what Solomon sees in direct correlation with his own life. This is what he has experienced. And to him, it seems so unfair. It seems so meaningless and empty. So how does he begin to deal with the tension in his own soul? We get a picture of that starting in verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind." What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. That's why he starts off in verse 2, vanity of all vanities. Why do people do what they do? What motivates them to do it? Why do it at all? What gain can I find in this world that will bring satisfaction? Put yourself in his shoes for a second. What if you had a year to take off of your life, say a sabbatical, a whole year, and you were given one purpose? The purpose was this, go out into the world and make sense of it. Right? Go out into the world and connect the dots, unscramble the egg, whatever you want to attach that to, go out and make sense of the world you find yourself in. What do you think you'd come back to report to us? You'd probably walk in and be like, guys, I'm out. I got nothing for you. (laughs) It doesn't make any sense. This is the task that he, Solomon, was bent to. And in, in, in the old Hebrew language, when it talks about the heart pursuing this task, it includes the mind, the will, and the emotions of an individual. So if you think about that thought experiment of of having a year off of your job, your family, your college, whatever it may be, and you are tasked to figure out the world, your emotions, your will, your mind are a part of this equation. And I think you would echo Solomon's heart by saying, yeah, it's but a vapor. 
The wind comes and it goes and it does not make sense. We sympathize with it. He goes on to say, in verse 16, You'll see, I, King Solomon, said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart had had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. That's interesting. I perceive that this is also but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. What do we learn about Solomon? We learn that he had time to investigate depravity. The depths of depravity. So when we think about Solomon, Solomon, we can assume that Solomon did things saw things connected with people that did things that were not necessarily wise. But he was on a mission to investigate it. And unfortunately for him, it corrupted him. He had flaws, a depraved heart. And although he set out to accomplish great things for the Lord, his choices, despite the wisdom that was given to him, would fail him. And his sorrow could have come from the way that he lived his life. I just want to read this for you. It tells us a little bit more about the choices Solomon made. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read it for you. It comes from 1 Kings chapter 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonite, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel... You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they, uh, you will be with them, for they surely will turn away your heart, catch this, after their gods. Solomon clung to these and loved them. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turn away his heart, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after the other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord of Israel, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went, went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemash, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. You know what that mountain is? The Mount of Olives. Fascinating. Worshiping the gods and the abominations of the tribes. And he would make offerings and sacrifices to those gods. Now, all of this feels quite heavy and depressing. It feels like we should look up to a guy like Solomon, shouldn't we? And there's aspects of his life that we should, absolutely. And he's painting for us a season in his life where he's old and he's looking back and he's saying, that essentially, the choices I have made, even in wisdom, they were vanity. One of the beauties of being exposed like this and exposed to these words is the sharp reality that we start to think about a solution, don't we? Well, what's the point? If the world operates this way, then what is the solution? If work and our toiling and relationships is a part of our daily lives, then how do we come to terms with it? How do we actually live in a broken world because of sin? The whole rest of the summer, we're going to help answer those questions. To alleviate some of those tensions, ultimately, we need a purpose outside of ourselves, something that allows us to stay the course in a hurtful, broken world. And there would be one who would come and provide us just that. 
Someone who came to bring us hope and a purpose. There would be one who would come, stand upon the very mountain that Solomon once worshipped Molech, and he would preach about the good news of the gospel, about hope, death, and resurrection. While inviting his listeners to take that gift, he would be crucified. In that town, buried and resurrected, he, Jesus, felt the weight of the world upon his shoulders. The weight and the emotions of the same broken world that Solomon was describing. And the invitation is the same. Come to Jesus. The one who on Mount of Olives gave us a discourse on how to live as we should in the world, we find ourselves ultimately conquering death, conquering sin, and giving the human heart a chance at joy to the full. Joy despite a failed business. Joy despite a medical emergency. Joy despite the fear of a marriage on the rocks. You see, Solomon, for all his wisdom and his striving, his successes and the pursuit of his fleshly appetites failed to rest on the joy of the Lord for his strength. The book of Ecclesiastes is a window into that man's heart. It is a gift. It is a gift that has been given to us that we may reflect on what was learned by a man who had it all yet did not finish well. And as we see, even in his own life, joy can be found. A purpose can be found in the toiling and in the striving. You see this in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-eight. Therefore, almost like in, in a response to this book, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's hinting at a purpose bigger than the labor itself. It's, it's hinting at a purpose ba- greater than your emotions, greater than your circumstances. This is the journey we will be on over the coming weeks, a journey that will take the reality of light and paint a hopeful brush over the landscape. What if we were the type of people that were not waiting for the world to provide what we wanted from it, but were more focused on how to live faithfully and joyfully in it as followers of Christ? Laughing enjoying the simple things that come our way and helping others to see that true joy can be had in the toil. True joy can be had in the tension. What if we could capture the time spent chasing after the world and prioritize living on mission, finding something that motivates you beyond your comfort? Even in your failures, even in the times when you and I feel that all is lost, there is still a small voice that says, move on. Trust me. Don't give up. Find joy in the little things of life. Celebrate with laughter and a smile on your face, for it is all fleeting. Your life, my life, is but a vapor. Here one day, gone the next. leaving us with a foundational big idea to think about as we start this series. Life is full of toil, but it is our choice to live in such a way that joy and hope can flourish. See, if you go into life thinking that life itself, the world in which we live in, will provide you with everything you need to be content, happy, satisfied, joy-filled, you will be greatly disappointed. But if you come into the world and understand that you're entering a place that is broken, that cannot provide the the deep longings of your heart, there is a chance for you and I then to approach this brokenness and live in such a way that is attractive because you are joy-filled. You're making a choice every morning before your your feet hit the ground to say, today, God is good. 
It's outside of yourself. It's outside of your emotions. It's outside of you identifying with your pains and your struggles. Your identity is in Christ. My grandma lived a long life, but a life full of toil and pain, tragedies. Although that was the case, she would never hesitate to remind us on a daily basis that she was getting old, that life moved on quick. She would say every morning, when I get up, I head to the bathroom, look myself in the mirror and say, today is going to be a good day. This took with me over many years as I got to hear her tell stories of her life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And there was a lot of ugly, a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain, regret in her voice. And she would always say, you only get one shot, one life, one chance to leave a legacy. And I think this is Solomon's legacy. I think it's his legacy, looking back on his life and ultimately saying, man, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It was chasing after this wind that I can't understand. And even though I was given all this wisdom and and riches and authority, and I was able to pursue the longings of my flesh, at the end of the day, when you add it all up, it's vanity. It's vanity if that is your only hope. It is. It's great. Vanity. But as Christians, our labor is not in vain. We serve a Savior that's given you a purpose, a trajectory, a future, a future beyond the vanity of life, a future beyond the vapor of your time on this earth. So the question that we're going to wrestle with all summer and an exercise for you to do is answer this simple question, what are you here for? What are you here for? What does that look like for you over the next 20 years, 15, 60, if you're given? Don't worry about what you're going to leave behind. Get up every day, look yourself in the mirror and say, God, I'm going to trust you today. And my heart is to be faithful to what you have for me in the next minute, in the next 10 minutes, in the next hour. The people, the places, the jobs the relationships you find yourself in. Why do you and I exist? Those are the things we wrestle with, the tensions we're gonna look at. And I hope that as we march through the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon can give you some indications, some markers, some encouragements for you to apply in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this blunt, uh, kind of black and white picture of what the world looked like for a man who had it all, the king, someone who at, at any time could have anything brought to him at his fingertips, and yet as we even just see in chapter one of Ecclesiastes, there's a sense of disappointment, that there's a sense of it just wasn't good enough. So I pray that as we, as we walk through this piece of wisdom literature, you would give us just that, wisdom. Wisdom to see our world, wisdom to see what are the things that we are anchoring our hearts to. And maybe they're good things. Maybe they're wonderful things. Maybe they're the things that you've created and, 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 and they bring us uh, some satisfaction and maybe some joy, but maybe they're not the best things, the ultimate things. Maybe we attach our lives and our identity to you as we wrestle with our own vanities in our lives, the chasing after multiple winds in multiple directions. Give us hope. Give us peace and help us be Christians, Christ followers that are full of joy in this broken landscape. In your name, amen. Amen. Please stand.
stand with me.